Good evening to my Real World Podcast family. How you guys doing? Today I'm bringing you another exclusive interview, and I have on the phone with us a young lady by the name of Camille Gamet. Am I saying that correctly, Camille? Last name? Yes, you are. So, how are you doing today, Miss Camille? Not bad. I'm all right. How are you? I'm great. Can't complain. Won't complain. But first of all, before we go any further, let me thank you right now for allowing me to be able to sit down to interview you for the show. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah. You've been imp- you've been locked up since am I, 2013, am I correct? Correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, Camille, from the time you've been locked up, what have you been doing in, in the prison system since you've been locked up, may I ask? I have been just striving to be a better person. I've been trying to use this time to focus on what has brought me here and to try to learn from it. Um, As far as programming, um, I've completed healing and trauma. I've participated in Alcoholics Anonymous, which I feel like played a role in bringing me to prison. There's a lot of programs that are available for prisoners here, but unfortunately due to the amount of time I'm sitting to, lifers get placed on the back burner a lot, Mm -hmm. just due to the amount of time that we have. So people with lesser time usually get first place for those types of programs. So my main focus has just been working on my appeal and fighting my conviction. I've spent a lot of time in the law library and I've done a lot of research on Michigan case law and I've learned a lot and I've just been working on my case and fighting for my freedom. Okay, now that's a good thing that you're in there in the law library educating yourself on the law and educating yourself on other things because that is something that a lot of inmates when, when, when we're locked up don't take full advantage of that. They let that go to the sideline and they trust their attorneys more than trusting themselves basically um i just feel like i had a point appointed uh, court appointed attorney and i don't feel like anybody can fight my fight as well as i can because i don't feel like anybody else can be as passionate as i can about my fight mm-hmm. so with that being said i just feel like it's up to me to continue to strive to educate myself as much as I can. So that's been my focus to just, I've spent as much time as inmates are permitted in the law library, just researching and educating myself um, and learning as much as I can. Because first of all, we have a low success rate of public defenders in Michigan. So just with that, alone, you know, I know it's my obligation to fight for my life as much as I can, because nobody else is going to fight for me like I can. Correct. And now you're 100% right about that. Now, out of the programs, out of, you know, doing the programs, what is it like for you in prison? Are you um, conversing with other inmates? Are you trying to counsel other inmates and, you know, talk to them and help them to not make the mistakes that you made? Are you doing any of that? Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot of younger inmates in here, and there's a lot of people who, um, I've seen people who come in here with a year and are still here to this day doing five years, six, seven years later, or I see people who come in here and they get into the homosexuality and they... You have one minute remaining. Go ahead, keep going, keep going. They They choose to stay here to be with their girlfriends, and these people, these are women with children, you know, so a lot of people come in here and they lose focus or they let this lifestyle consume them. So it's a very sad thing and it's an unfortunate thing to me. So I try to um, tell these people, you know, I want people to learn from my mistakes because, you know, at this moment, I don't have a second chance. So when I speak to these people, my main thing is I keep a very positive mind frame. I don't choose to let my circumstances 
get me down. Um, I feel like God has the final say. And I feel like, you know, he says never let anybody steal your joy. So I'm always smiling. I'm always upbeat. And a lot of people don't think that I am a so-called lifer because of my mentality. So I'm always trying to keep people smiling and keep people in a good headspace and keep people, you know, keep them up and set it down. You know, because I feel like the system is too... Thank you for using GTL. Now, Miss Gamet. I want you to t- yes. I want you to tell my real world podcast audience. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing in your childhood. Okay. Um, how far back do you want me to go with this? I want you to go back as far as you feel that we we need to go back, as you know, because we want to we want to know who you are. We want to know who the real Camille is. We want to know that person. Versus the the person that we saw in the media that the media and the prosecution painted of you. So let's go with go with what you feel that we should know. All right. Well, um, I was born in Jackson, Michigan, to my parents, um, Joyce Carlson and James Williams. Mm-hmm. Uh. I don't remember my parents too much. Um, My mother has told me once I was older that my father was very physically abusive. And due to that, she left him when I was two years old and she moved to Iowa. And from there, she ended up with a man by the name of Moses Green who was very physically abusive to us. He was also physically abusive to my mother. He was also sexually abusive. I don't remember that. Um, My biological mother ended up losing custody of her children back in 1985. And then we were placed in foster homes with the gamut, uh, butch gamut turned out to be a molester um, for several years, at which point I ended up telling the counselor at school. So um, I grew up around a lot of dysfunctionalism. I didn't have a lot of love as a child. I remember being a lot, feeling lonely as a child a lot, um, feeling unloved, and I didn't connect well with people because I felt like I, I just remember feeling like a burden I just felt like I couldn't trust people a lot um, I was in juvenile homes from the ages of 11 to 16 in 13 different juvenile homes until I ran away to back to Jackson to basically meet, per se, my biological parents, um, to discover that my mother was a crackhead and my father was a paranoid schizophrenic. I tried staying with him for a while, but after a week, he pulled a butcher knife on me, and I ended up in the street at 16. I didn't know anyone in Jackson. I was scared. And my foster mother would not let me come back home. So from that point, um, I became a prostitute at the age of 16. And I just remember feeling very lost at that time, very sad, and just not really knowing where to turn. So... From that point, um, I just was in the streets a lot. So basically, I was pretty much, I didn't have any kind of family um, direction, any kind of family support, any kind of things that a normal child should have at that age. I was 16, so um, I ended up, I think that's why I started being with a lot of 
abusive men and from just seeing my mother with abusive men at a young age, I think that's where that cycle began. Okay. Now, I want to go back a little bit. When you say that um, sexual abuse came in from your mother's boyfriend, Moses Green, did that... Yes. Did Moses Green sexually molest you, or it was just towards your mother? No, he was molesting me and my brothers and sisters. I don't remember it because I was two, but... What happened was, is when my mother lost custody of us, um, Child Protective Services became involved, and in my later years of me being in the juvenile homes, I actually had the same judge on my case who was the same judge who terminated my mother's criminal rights, and he felt that it was relevant for me to read the reports of why he terminated my mother's rights, and he felt that that was... Um, part of the reason why I was having behavior problems in my youth. And so when I read the reports, it was in there from when social services would visit to our house and my brothers and sisters would report it and things like that. But me being so young, I don't remember it, but they had told the social workers that my mother's boyfriend, Moses Green, was touching me and things like that when I was two years old. Okay. Now, I want to talk back about Butch Gamut. How old yes. were you when Butch Gamut started sexually molesting you? I was nine years old. Nine years old. So the molestation, molesting kept, start, kept going from nine until you ran away at 16 or it stopped before, before 16? No. It happened from age nine to 11. And when I was 11 years old, I had told my foster mother and she had became angry with me because she didn't want me to tell anyone. But I had ended up telling the counselor at school. And at that point, the children's services had became involved and made him leave the house. And then basically she had resented me for that because it had hit the paper, and it was kind of a little small neighborhood, and everybody knew everybody, and so it was just pretty much an embarrassment for her that her husband was known for that, and so she kind of just resented me after that, and due to her not reporting it when she was supposed to, um, she was charged with child neglect, which made it so social workers would have to come out to the house and check on our well-being every two weeks and so she would tell them that I was having all these behavior problems that I really wasn't until they finally placed me in juvenile homes. Okay, so basically the key was to have you removed from the home so Butch could come back home. Is that right? Or possibly that is that it? No, she just wanted me removed from the home because she felt like I ruined her happy home. Okay. Now, can I ask you, did anything ever happen to Butch? Did he get charged or anything? Yes, he was charged, and we were sent to counseling, and they were asked if we wanted him to be sent to jail, and they told us if he was sent to jail that they would probably beat him up or possibly even kill him. And us being little children, we still felt like he was our father, so we cried for him and we begged him not to send him to jail. So because of that, he was not given any jail time. Okay. Now, through any of your situations, have you heard anything from the Gamut family or not? No, not at all. Now, can I, can I ask you a question? Um, by knowing that your name is Gamut, after a man who was molesting you at the age of 9 to 11, how does that make you feel to wear his last name? That still actually bothers me to this day. And I had always planned on getting that name changed. My first given name was Camille Bernice Carlton. But once I was adopted, um, that name was changed to Camille Tiffany Gamut. So that is my legal given name, and due to me being in prison, I have to go by that name. But 
uh, when I first came here, I did attempt to change it because we have a policy where you can change it and you have to state the circumstances. Um, so I felt like my circumstances were very relevant. Um, but unfortunately, that policy has been changed, so it's no longer permitted. So therefore, um, I'm stuck with that name, but I prefer to go by Mia, and that's what most people call me. Okay. So this, this is what we're going to call you, Mia, throughout the rest of this, okay. this interview. We're going to call you Mia. We're not going to call you Miss Gamut, and we're not going to call you Camille. And I, I normally call every inmate that I interview, I call them Mr. or Miss So by their last name. So we're just going to call you Mia. Okay. Um, what okay is, I appreciate that. You're more than welcome, Mia. Um, your, your biological parents, where are they today? Yes. Where are they today? Uh, I don't have much contact with my biological parents. My mother is in Mesa, Arizona, and my father is in Detroit, Michigan. And I haven't heard from my mother since I've been incarcerated. Um, she's never really liked me since I met her when I was 16. Mm. And my father, um, I haven't heard from him for the last three years. So, so now when you, you say your mother never liked you from the age of 16 when you first met her, do you know the reason why? Did she ever state the reason of her, why she didn't like you? No, she never told me. Okay. So basically, Mia, we, we're going to say you had a pretty rough life coming up through the system. Yes. By you having a rough childhood, how well did you re relate to other kids? Um, I think as far as me relating to other kids, I think I did good in that area. Um, I was a straight A student. I was like top of my class. I was the one that always had the answer. You know, I was real outgoing in school. Um, I used to play sports. I played soccer, softball, basketball was my favorite. My fourth grade year, I was on the undefeated team, mm -hmm. and I was like the star player, you know. So um, as far as me relating to other children, I don't think that it was so much as that. I just think that I didn't reach out to people to try to get help for my situation. The only one that I did really tell about what was going on at home was my best friend, and we just agreed that we wouldn't tell anybody. Okay. So was your best friend going through some of the same things you were going through or your best friend was just someone that you felt comfortable in, you know, letting know what was going on? No, her life was the exact opposite. She had both her parents in the home. Um, she had a very loving family. You know, I would actually, she lived right across the street from me because I grew up in a small town. And so I would go over there to kind of escape, you know, and I actually remember one day when... Um, Butch Gamet had held me down and I think he wanted to rape me that day but I cried so bad and I just kept asking him what he was doing so I went over to her house and I had um, tried to go on a trip she was going on with her family out of town but I wasn't able to go but I they didn't know why I wanted to go so bad but I had gone on trips with them and things like that before okay so um and how old were you around this time? <clears throat> I think I was nine or ten when that happened. Okay. Now, to your knowledge today, is Butch Gamut, is he still alive or is he dead? He's still alive and I'm sure still a pervert. Okay. Has he tried to reach out to you while you were locked up to apologize or anything? No, he's never tried to apologize to me at all in any type of way. No, he hasn't. Okay. What about your adopted mother? Did she ever try to reach out to apologize while you've been locked up? No, she hasn't either. Okay. They both pretty much just wrote me off after everything happened. Okay. Well, all I can say is possibly, you know, that was a, a good thing for you because you know you you know you survived that you, you feel what yeah, i'm saying yeah. and and and, I, and i'm happy that you got away from that 
Now, um, I want to um, ask you a, a question, okay? Now, Mr. Marcel Hill, this is the young man that you're, you're convicted of, of killing. Could you tell us what type of person was Marcel, and how, like, how did you meet Marcel, and what type of person was he? Okay, so I met Marcel back when I was 16 years old. Um, like I mentioned before, I didn't really have the family dynamic, per se. So I was in the streets a lot, and I can just remember that Marcel was always a place I could go if it was late at night and I didn't have a place to stay, I would always go to him. I don't remember exactly how we met. I think it was just in passing one day. Mm -hmm. But he was a place that I would go to when I didn't have a place to stay. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, I could go to his place. Okay. So we had that type of bond. Okay. So you guys had a, a pretty good bond, a great bond, if, you know, I could say that, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, so the courts and everyone, let's see, the courts and the media, they, they painted Marcel as this good guy that was, had, that had a disability, um, that he had like um, a friendly childlike personality. Would, right. you, would you say that to be true? Um, I would say that Marcel was a manipulator. Um, I had always thought he was friendly. Yes, I did. That was my interpretation of him, even back when I was 16 to back when we linked back up when I was 30. I never, um, saw the side of him. It wasn't presented to me until after the situation happened where he had deceased and then I learned that he wasn't who I thought he was, but I was just shocked because I can't imagine. I still, it's still hard for me to imagine the things that was brought to me by my defense counsel. Okay. Now, I'm, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm waiting on the paperwork for that to come in, and we, we'll touch that about the things that you found out about the def you know, about Mr. Marcel through the defense attorney. Now, um, Marcel was, at the time of his demise, he was 38, and how old were you? I would have been, um, I want to say 30 or 31. 30 to 30 or 31. So Marcel, basically, just say you, he was seven to eight years older than you. I mean, yeah, about six. Correct. Okay. Um, so um, going back 16, uh, so Marcel back then was... I think he was like 24. 24, yeah, 24, okay. Something like that. 24, yeah. 25, okay. So, can I ask you a, a personal question? How old were you when you and Marcel became, started becoming intimate with one another? Well, actually, when I was 16, we had basically, um, it was like once or twice or something like that had happened. But he was always more interested in me, pursuing me. Like, he just had this crush on me, and he would, you know, tell me he thought I was pretty, things like that. And I was young, and he wasn't my type, so I just wasn't, you know, even paying attention to that, really. So it had happened, you know, like I said, once or twice or something. We had engaged in that when I was 16. And then, like I said, I didn't link back up with him until uh, 2012 when I came back to Jackson from Cincinnati. Okay, so would you say, were you the aggressor towards him or pursuing him, or he's the one to pursue you for intimacy? Um, that would have been him. Um, I was sitting on my brother's porch one day, and he had walked past, and I just recognized him. So I had, I had left Jackson, I think, when I was 17, and I hadn't been back for all those years. So I was basically just trying to get back familiar with people and you know just get into something basically and I saw him and I stopped him and I asked him did he remember me and from that point he gave me his cell phone number and you know he wanted me to meet up with him that night which I did but yeah he was the um he was pursuing me as far as us being together so basically Mr. Hill should have been locked up for 
molesting a young lady. He should have been locked up back then at this time, right or wrong. Well, uh, well you, I under, don't, I don't. you were underage, so in the state of Michigan at that time, the legal age to consent was 18 then, and now it's, it, it became 16 about 2005 or 2006, around that time, the age to consent was 16 then. At about 2005, right. 2006. So back then, it is clearly said that that was a form of molestation that Mr. Mar Mr. Hill committed. If, if we're legally speaking, I would say yes, but I, I was not unconsensual to it. I but, put it like that. But you were only 16 years of age. It doesn't matter. Correct. You consented. You have one minute remaining. It doesn't matter if you consented or not. It's the law, and he shouldn't have been pursuing you because you were only 16 years old. So I would look at his family should, or someone, the court should should have found that odd. Did Mr. Um, Hill smoke or drink that you knew of? Yes, um, on a regular basis. Actually, when I met him when I was 16, mm -hmm. I was selling dope at the time, and he used to come and cop for me. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the reasons why I never took him seriously, too. And also, back when I linked up with him, yep, uh, back in 2012, that was one of my first questions. Like, you know, do you still smoke crack? You know, because he looked completely different. You know, his physique was different. He dressed well, you know. So he just didn't present himself as that type of person. Um... And I was somewhat naive to that type of lifestyle of a person who uses drugs as opposed to a person who sells drugs because I was always on the other side, even though my mother, you know, used crack. I wasn't around her like that when I was younger. Okay. So, you know, he was able to keep it hidden from me. But I did know that he drank and smoked marijuana. Okay. Now, at the time when you were 16 and you guys were intimate, was he smoking crack then that you knew of? Yes. Okay. May 18, 2003, you were charged with the murder of your living boyfriend, Mr. Marcel Hill. Am I correct? May 18, 2013. Yes, May 8th. Yes. That's what I said, May 18, 2013. Yes. Okay. Right. Now, could you take us back to that day of May... 18th, 2013. What happened with you guys that day? So that day started just like any other day. Um, I woke up, you know, made breakfast. I did the dishes. Um, I remember that I wanted some cigarettes. So I had went to the family dollar store and I had went to return some items so I could get some money to buy some cigarettes. And he wanted to go with me. Uh, I know that before we left the house, he didn't like the clothes that I was wearing. He was making comments, complaining that my shorts were too short, just saying things. He was agitated. He was saying things like, my girl wants to go and be a hoe. You just want these niggas to look at you, this, this, and that. So I was somewhat frustrated with that. Um, I basically told him I didn't need a chaperone to go to the Dollar General store to go get my cigarettes. And um, he still insisted that he walk with me. So the walk was okay, but then by the time I had came back, I just was fed up with his whole vibe was just off. You know, it was just negative. He just wanted to argue, he was complaining. So I had seen a man from our church and I had asked him for a ride to another store because I wasn't able to get my cigarettes at the first store. Um, he had gave me a ride, and he actually asked me, like, did I want him to wait for my cell? And I was like, no. I wanted to get away from him. Uh, I called my brother, and I linked up with him for a few hours. I had told my brother that... He was just being real 
hostile, real argumentative. I think my exact words was that he was driving me crazy. And I was just telling my brother, like, you know, I'm not feeling that. Like, I'm, I don't want to argue with this nigga. So, uh, after I rode around with my brother for a couple hours, he had dropped me back off. And I went back to my apartment with Marcel. Uh, I basically was asking him, like, are you good now? Like, are you, you know, I don't want to argue with you. Like, I just want to, I want to chill, whatever. So, we had rolled up a blunt. Um, I was sipping on some beer. He was sipping on some beer. Uh, before the blunt could even really go out, basically, he started tripping again, like, saying things like, well, with a man from church trying to come on to you, um, talking about my shorts again, like, just acting crazy. And I had basically told him, like, he started cussing and just going on. And I was like, I told you, like, this is why I left. And I was like, look, I'm about to just leave. So, uh, I had left. He followed me out of the house. Uh, I was, I went to a bar for a minute. He had said a comment to me that really made me upset. He had actually said to me, whose dick is better, mine or Butch Gamut? So at that point, I had just had enough. So I dipped on him, basically. I kept walking. Um, I cut through an alley, and I lost him, basically, so he couldn't find me. I had called his aunt. I want to say his aunt, um, Brenda. Aunt Brenda. I had called her. And basically, I just told her, because she was familiar with how he would act sometimes when he was drinking. He was just known to, his whole family, Uncle Robert, all of them knew that he would just, he couldn't contain the way he drank sometimes. He just couldn't hold his drink, basically. Mm -hmm. So, I had called Cousin Brenda, because basically I told her, you know, I want to come talk to you, you know, because it seemed like she could always get through to him. Regardless, you know, even one time when he was drunk at her house, she had a whole episode at her house, and... It seemed like he would listen to her, so I just told her, you know, I'm going to come talk to you. Uh, before I made it to her house, um, I was going to go buy some drinks for her and her dude, and we all was just going to sit and talk, but the store was closed. So her house is about two houses from Jack's Bar. So as I walked past Jack's Bar, I hear music coming out. So I dip off in there, and I bought me a couple drinks, and before I know it, I'm singing karaoke at the bar. <laughs> I had called her again, and I had told her, don't tell him, you know, where I'm at. But she obviously must have told him because, I don't know, I guess, according to witnesses in the investigative report, I guess it was about 30 minutes later, I don't know, because I honestly have been drinking all day. I had popped a couple of Um I had been smoking weed, so I was getting further and further intoxicated. Uh, he comes up in the bar, and I tried to hide. Like, I tried to hide my face, but I knew he would see me. And he um, was basically just... You know, still trying to argue. He was calling me hoes, calling me bitches. He was, like, grabbing on me, telling me he wanted me to come home with him. And I was, like, pulling away from him. I was telling him I wasn't going nowhere with him because I didn't want to proceed to argue with him. I just told him, like, you've been tripping all day. I'm not feeling that. Like, I just, I just want to stop. You know, I was like, just stop. So uh, at one point he had asked me to buy him a drink, and I told him to sit down and... Uh, just chill and for some reason he ran out the bar and I later found out it was because he had stole somebody's purse a month before so he was to me like the signs he was showing me is that he still was just acting crazy and stuff so I didn't want to leave with him because me knowing him I already knew like when I get home I'm gonna have to argue with you I didn't want to argue with him so uh I had called um Aunt Brenda from the bar and I told her you know I'm right around the corner at the bar and I asked her did she want to come over there she said no I think I had called my brother asked him did he want to come to the bar he said no so I was just up in there you know like I said just getting further and further drunk um 
after that, um, he ended up coming back to the bar. I guess he was following me around the bar. I really don't remember him following me around the bar. But I guess according to witnesses, he was following me around the bar and kind of like harassing me. I know he was grabbing on me. He was like trying to take my house keys and trying to take my cell phone. And basically in attempts to get me to leave with him. Mm-hmm. To where some people from the bar had called the police on him just for all the commotion he was causing. Uh, when the police came, I was mad because I thought like he tried to call him on me. So I'm telling him like, you need to arrest him. He stole somebody's purse, you know, like this. Cause the lady, actually the lady whose purse he stole was at the bar that night. And so they recognized him and that's why he had ran out the bar. And so I'm telling them like, yeah, he stole this lady's purse or whatever. and. I don't know what he said to them, but they ended up leaving and I guess telling him to leave the bar. And then I guess he had came back uh, maybe about an hour later, I guess he came back and he was dressed in different clothes, I guess in an attempt to be inconspicuous. Okay. So at this point, he comes back to where I'm at. He's grabbing on me, pulling on me, you know calling me bitches and hoes, all this again, trying to be argumentative, trying to get me to engage in that, and I'm still just walking away. And I'm just telling him, like, I'm not leaving with you, leave me alone. So they call the police again. So after the police come the second time, um, I left the bar, and he left the bar. Hmm. I'm not sure where he went at first. Um, I When I left the bar, I fell down. Like, I was falling down drunk. So... I decided to go get some food because, you know, basically to try to sober up. So I ended up on East Michigan at the Coney Island. I sat in there and had some food. And after that, um, I decided to bring him some food home. So I remember um, there was some man. You have one minute remaining. And once I come home, he was sitting there on the chair. And I just remember that he looked at me like he was mad, but I didn't really think nothing of it. I just kind of felt like, you know, it was just like gonna, you know, just any other time when he was mad at me, I didn't realize that it was gonna escalate to the point that it did that night. When I came home from the bar, I remember that Marcel was sitting in the chair and he just looked like he was mad at me, like I said, but I didn't really think that everything that happened was going to happen. Um, there's a, a lot of pieces that I don't remember before the actual incident of me getting woke up for his attack on me, and that's because of all the liquor and weed and pills that I took, so... It's a blank spot for me, and that's where, just when I came home, I just don't remember getting in the bed, falling asleep, just one of those nights, you know, where you just had too much. So, I know that um, at some point I did get in the bed and fall asleep, and what had woke me up was when the glass broke. It was just loud, loud glass, and I didn't know at first what it was. Um, later, when I saw the crime scene photos, I realized it was a coffee table that he had shattered. Um, so I woke up to that. I remember just um, sitting up, you know, just startled in the bed and kind of like gasping, like just, I didn't really know what was going on, like just knew something wasn't right. So. I started trying to turn on the lamp, and all the while while I'm doing this, I was getting hit in my head. I'm not sure if he had something that he was hitting me with or what, because it was dark and, you know, I just woke up to this, so. Um, it all happened really fast. But, um, Take, take, listen, take your time. Take your time. Uh, okay. 
I never went and got the knife. The knife was already there. Um, I know that I jumped up and I started swinging the lamp and the lamp had hit Marcel. And I turned and he was still hitting me. And I had fell. And I really was just trying to look for my purse, you no, know, look for my cell phone so I could call the police. But um, during all that, when I fell and I was just reaching around for stuff in the dark, he was still hitting me, and my hand felt the knife. And I jumped up, and that's when I stabbed him. Uh, honestly, after that happened, I was like pacing back and forth and I was yelling at him and I was asking him, why did he hit me while I was asleep? And he wasn't answering me. And it was at this point that I began to notice that the apartment was just all messed up. And I was like, just trying to put it together because I, I couldn't remember that it wasn't like that when I came home. So I knew that something had happened that I still, to this day, I don't know what happened before I fell asleep. But when I was asking him, like, why did he hit me? And I was yelling at him for him to answer me, and I heard him gurgle. And so, at that point, I just knew, like, this is this is serious. But it really didn't hit me. Like, I didn't really realize that I had stabbed him. I just kind of, in my mind, like, I just thought I was fighting him, and it happened so fast. So... At that point, I got dressed, and I ran out the house, and I started calling 911. And I called them four times and just told them, can they hurry, can they hurry? And by the time they got there, it was too late. Okay. When the police arrived, what happened? Um... When the police arrived, I was outside. Um, I was kind of like sitting directly on the side of my apartment. And they later would say that I did that because I was trying to um, elude them in some type of way. But that I, I was very, very intoxicated. So that's what I was doing to me made sense in my mind, but I know it doesn't really make sense. But I know that the first thing they was going to do when a situation happens is they ask to question a person and that they might say, we're going to detain you and put you in the back of this police car. And that's what I was trying to avoid because I wanted to go to the hospital with him. I wanted to make sure he was okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was on the side of the house like that. But once they did approach me, um, they had asked me what happened and I lied. Um, I told him I was walking home from a friend's house. And they put me, they did exactly what I knew they would do. They put me in the car and said they were going to detain me for questioning. And at that point, they took me to homicide. Okay. So you didn't make it back into the house at all. You was outside the, the full time. No, I didn't. Okay. Now, in the courts, they say that you stabbed him 11 times and you blunt for, he was killed um stabbed he was killed by being stabbed 7 times 11 times and they right. say he was blunt force trauma to the head with a uh, a frying pan or something of that nature right. and they said it was bloody when they found it and you didn't tell them about that part they noticed it when they found the bloody frying pan skillet is that true um i'm sorry the last part of your question i, I didn't hear okay they said that um about the frying pan yeah the, the blood they said they found a, a bloody frying pan after they had detained you and you didn't mention the right. frying, the the uh, blood, the frying pan, and it was it was bloody. And they said that you, they said that you used that to bash him in the head with. Is that true? No, that's not true. I told them I don't know how the frying pan got there. Um, in the initial reports from the first two or three responding officers who came to the scene, 
the reports say that the frying pan was partially under his arm. Like, I guess they said he had died on his back. And they said that the frying pan was, like, partially under his arm. And his arm was, like, twisted behind his back. But later, Detective Shooty came in. And his report says that um, the frying pan was laying next to his body, like up by his head area. And in the crime scene photos, the frying pan is not touching his body. It's exactly where Detective Shooty said that it was. But there is a lot of discrepancies in Detective Shooty's, uh, his own reports and his testimony. We call him lying on the witness stand. And that's actually one of my arguments is tampering with the crime scene because where they say that that frying pan was and where it actually was doesn't match. Um, Detective Shooty said that the lights were off in the bathroom. There was just a lot of things, so that's actually one of my issues for appeal. Okay. So, is it possible, is this, could he have been hitting you in the head with the frying pan, or no? That, that's what I believe, that's what I think, yes. But I, I, I don't know because I just know I was getting hit hard. I don't know what it was that he was hitting me with mm-hmm. or if it was just his fist. Okay. I'm not sure. Did the police ever take you to the hospital to get looked at? No. Okay. Did you explain, Did you were you hurting or told them your head was hurting or you was hurting anywhere? Did you tell them that? No, um, at the time when everything happened, initially when I was taken to homicide, I, I um, fell asleep or passed out or whatever. I don't know because, like I said, I had been hitting my head and I had been very intoxicated. They gave me a PBD, uh, PBT test, which that was about, I want to say, two hours, two to four hours. I will have to look at the documents, but that was two to four hours after I was taken a homicide and I blew two times the legal limit of intoxication. So had they taken that when I first got there, then I'm sure then I would have blew extremely higher, but they never um, gave me any kind of blood test to see what kind of substances I had in me or anything. They just asked me and I lied about it because in my mind I was still trying to protect him. I, I really didn't understand that he was dead. Okay. So, with with all that being said and done, okay, because usually they would, uh, any homicide officer, uh, a smart homicide officer, or a, a seasoned, thorough homicide officer would have done that. They would have took a breathalyzer, or took your blood, or took you to the hospital, you know, to have you checked out because they want to make they cross all, I mean, dot out, dot all their eyes and cross all their T's. To make sure everything is is good on their end. So you're saying that none of that happened with these homicide officers? No, that didn't happen. And with me being as intoxicated and high and all the pills I had taken as I was, I basically was probably numb to it, you know. And the situation was so traumatic that I wasn't thinking about myself or what was wrong with me. My only concern the whole time, I just kept asking them if he was okay. Okay. So, at this point in time, when did you find out that he had passed and didn't make it? Um, when Detective Shooty came into the homicide room to talk to me, he was asking me what happened. I just kept telling him, like, we need to go check on him. We need to see if he's okay. And he was telling me that he had passed away. And I was just, like, in complete denial. I just kept telling him, like... Y'all was supposed to do CPR, and y'all, no, why didn't y'all help him? Those kinds of things. And I actually asked him if he could take me back to him so I could say goodbye to him. But when I, they was in the courtroom, they tried to make it look like their words was that I asked to go view the body, but that's not how that happened. I just told them if they would let me just go say goodbye to him because I knew I wasn't going to be able to see him anymore. Okay. Wow, that's that's a deep one right there. Um, how long did it take them to charge you with homicide, with with the murder? Um, that same the the next day, or it took a couple couple days. Um, I woke up 
in a cell. They they took me out of the homicide room because I just lost it. Once it really hit me that he was gone, I, just, I lost it. I started throwing stuff everywhere and screaming and just going crazy. And so um, they took me out of there and they put me in some type of room and eventually I cried myself to sleep. And when I woke up, they told me I was being charged with open murder. Okay. And let me explain what open murder is to a lot of the audience. For you guys who don't know what open murder is, that means that the homicide officers or the prosecutor, they don't have enough evidence to, to rate it as a murder one or murder two or manslaughter. So they leave it up to the judge and the juror, the jury to come up with murder one, murder two, or manslaughter. So... That's what that means for a lot of you guys who always ask, what does open murder mean? Okay, here we go. On May 18, 2013, you murdered your boyfriend, Marcel, Marcel Hill. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. You claim, you are claiming self-defense. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Prior to May 18, 2013, were you aware that Marcel Hill... Had, a, had an extensive criminal history? Um, not all the way, no. Okay, just you, but you did know he just had a criminal history, but didn't know, based, did you know what it was for? You didn't know what it was for? I was aware to some aspects of his criminal history. Okay. Now, Prior to May 18, 2013, have you ever heard the name Tracy Mosley? Yes, I have. Okay. Prior to May 18, 2013, have you ever met Tracy Mosley? Yes, I have met Tracy Mosley back when I was 16 years old. Okay, Tracy Mosley. Okay, okay, I'm thinking Tracy is Tracy Mosley. Okay, thank you for correcting that. Yes, Tressie Mosley, yeah. okay. How did okay, you met her at sixteen. How did you meet Miss Mosley? Um man, that was such a long time ago. I think I just met her around the neighborhood. You know, uh we were around the same age. I wanna say when I met her I think she was like eighteen. I actually think I met her at my mother's house, um, like back in the summertime. Okay. Uh yeah. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read something off to you, okay? Tressie Mosley met Marcel Hill at Green World Party Store, located on West Biddle Street in Jackson, Michigan. During the time of meeting Marcel Hill, Miss Mosley was only 19 years of age. Miss Mosley had gotten comfortable with Mr. Hill. Miss Mosley and Mr. Marcel and Mr. Hill hung out on several different occasions, both parties had spent time at one another's place, casually, you know, casually only. On several different occasions, approximately five times within one month frame, they hung out, you know, just casual. That's it. Okay, she was hanging out at his place. He was hanging out at her place. Um, okay. She would spend the night at his, but she would not allow him to spend the night at hers or whatever, right? The friendship, okay. The friendship between... Mr. Mo Miss Mosley and Mr. Hill had ended because Marcel Hill tried to rape Miss Mosley. Miss Mosley was awakened by Mr. Hill trying to set force himself on her sexually. Meaning when she woke up, the tip of his penis had got into her vagina and she was naked from the from the waist down. Did you know about this before your court day? No, I did not. I actually found out that um, after my incarceration when me and Tressley Mosley had been incarcerated at the same time. Okay. And she had told me of that story. Okay. Now, Miss Tressie Mosley, and I have it right here, a signed affidavit willing to testify this in court that he, that Mr. Marcel Hill done these things to her. What happened? Why didn't this make it into court? Because this is damning evidence right here. Um, well, this did not make it into court because at the time, I was not aware of this. So, that was the reason for the affidavit. I had became aware of 
several rapes that were committed by Marcel Hill after he had become deceased. They were brought to my knowledge by my public defender. And we also had a girl by the, I don't remember her name, I want to say Tina Martin, maybe it might be her name. I'm not sure if that's her name or not. I will have to look into my records. But we did have another girl who actually, people were coming to me while I was in the county waiting to go to trial and just basically what the streets were saying like oh you didn't know that he raped people you didn't know this and that about him you know people were making comments like we thought he would be dead a long time ago because he beat women you know and there was a girl and um she had said that he had raped her so once she gave me her information i had given her information to my lawyer and he had looked up the case and he had found the case on record um Actually, Marcel had served 90 days for this case, and they had his DNA on file, but they told me that this information would not be admissible in court because he was never convicted of it because she had told me personally that she had dropped the charges because his family had begged her to because she was actually marrying his cousin. And I guess they had told her that he had changed. But we did have three for sure that he was convicted of, that we knew of, and ultimately... They were supposed to be brought into evidence, and at the last minute, the judge said the evidence was inadmissible. Okay, well, one of those women happened to be Heather Malone, because I'm holding up some papers yes. to the camera. Is that the young lady, Heather Malone? Correct. Okay, now, from what I read, Marcel, Mr. Hill, Miss Heather Malone was lost. She didn't know how to get to a certain street, and she ran into Mr. Hill and asked where was the street at and he volunteered his time to walk with her and to show her where it was because he was going that way so they cut through a, a abandoned schoolyard lot if i'm not mistaken the schoolyard lot and he said well hold on i gotta step back here and i gotta you know take a leak and right. as he went back there to do that he told her to stand back there with him because they're trespassing if the police see him that's trespassing and you know, some could get a ticket and possibly go to jail. So she came back there, and as she was trying to leave because something just wasn't right, he appeared and jumped in front of him, in front of her, and told her that you finna give, you're going to give me some, some vagina. We're just gonna say that you're gonna give me some vagina, uh, or I'm going to stab you. And she said it was a yeah. hole in the fence, and she mm -hmm. dived through, took off running, and jumped through that hole and ran or, or something of that nature but she didn't get far because he got her yeah he, he raped her to my understanding yes he raped her yes no he, she didn't get away but he raped her yeah she she get, got a yeah. little bit but she didn't get that far because he raped her and he went to jail for this he was in jail and he served time for this um let me pull up mr marcel hill's record because i have his record here okay can I ask you? Can I ask you a question, mm -hmm. Mia? Did Marcel ever forceful, forcefully rape you, or or beat on you before this this day happened? Um, no, he never raped me. Um, he there was times where he was aggressive with me, um, and he was aggressive with other women. Before the incident happened the 18th. But no, he never raped me. The night of the incident, I did wake up. Um, I was I woke up with my t-shirt and my thong on, and I did tell them that I don't remember how I got like that, being that I was so drunk. But they didn't really take that into consideration. So I don't, I don't really know what that was about that night. Okay. Well, right now, I'm holding up to the camera Mr. Marcel Hill's criminal record. Okay, Mr. Marcel Hill has on 11-14-2000 aggravated assault, non-family, other weapon. Okay, on, Feb oh, on February 10, 2005, Mr. Hill has a criminal sexual conduct, penetration, penis, vagina. That's Miss Heather Malone. On... Here we go again. February the 11th, 2005, criminal sexual conduct, second degree, forcible contact. Then we have again in March 18, 2005, 
sexual penetration, penis, vagina, criminal sexual conduct, third degree. Then we have 215-2012, assault and battery, simple assault. Then we have again, March the 1st, 2012, assault and battery, simple assault. And we have again, December 31st, 2012, assault and battery, simple assault. Why wasn't this man in prison? Um, excuse me, what did you say? Why wasn't he in prison? Um, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, he has served prison time for some of those um, charges. And I don't know, he had been released. And so, you know, that's a question, I guess, for the justice system. My question is, why was this... Um, evidence not admissible before the jury because according to Michigan law it is admissible to the jury exactly that was so you, are you telling me that this judge here did not allow any of this in court to be admissible yes yes okay now I want to speak a little bit on your judge um, judge McBain let's go off into judge McBain okay I in my opinion I feel that Judge McBain could possibly be a racist. That's just my opinion. Because it is okay. true that in his court, poor black people don't have a chance whatsoever. Um, there's it, This is public information, ladies and gentlemen, so you can go look up Judge McBain of Jackson, Michigan. And he over sentences people he does not follow the law when sentencing people and then the supreme court gets on him about sentencing people too harshly and he refuses and rejects to resentence people have you heard anything about this M mia um yes i have there's a fellow inmate of mine her name is dixon bay and she's going through something similar with that right now um she was uh, convicted, I think, of a second-degree murder, but for whatever reason, Judge McBain feels like she should be convicted of a first-degree murder, and so she had went through appeal with some, I think, some lawyers from Court of Appeal, and Sato was appointed to her case, and her appeal has been, she's been granted some relief, and they was, uh, the courts had told Judge McBain that she was sentenced too high because of the guidelines, but because he feels that she should have been sentenced for a first degree murder, he has been uncooperative in the court's instructions to lower her sentence. And so they've been, they're still going through this process of trying to get him to comply with the court's, the Supreme Court's instructions. And basically he's made comments like, I'm the judge, I can do what I want. Um, Basically, he's just real arrogant. He just kind of feels like he's untouchable with my view of him. You have one minute remaining. Another case with the People versus Stevens, uh, where he um, was basically just being hostile, being, you know, basically that same untouchable attitude in the courtroom, where his lawyers actually objected to him. I think the Stevens case was a child murder case or a child death case. And um, that case was ultimately overturned by the Supreme Court. Okay. And I bet you he was not too thrilled with that and not happy at all. Um, I wouldn't imagine, so no. <laughs> okay. Judge McBain had a mental breakdown and was spotted walking around downtown Jackson, Michigan, butt naked. Did you hear anything about that? Um, yes, I did. Um, according to just people talking, um, you know, how the streets talk, the word that I had received was that Judge McBain was walking around without clothes on and that he was high off of crack and that he had to ultimately be taken to the Anderson Building on East Michigan and was then put on a medical leave and removed from the bench, I think for 14 weeks. And then the word that I had received is that I was actually the first case or for sure the first capital case after he had been placed back on the bench wow so you mean to tell me they let this crack smoking judge oversee who had a mental breakdown walking around downtown Jackson Michigan butt naked high off crack they let him 
14 days, took him, put him on medical leave to clean himself up for 14 days and then come back and get on the bench and oversee cases. Is that what you're telling telling us? Well, I actually, I think it was fourteen a fourteen week medical oh, 14, leave. Oh, but, fourteen weeks. Yes, Four, was, fourteen yeah. weeks. Okay. Yeah, four, Still fourteen. Yeah, but the, yeah, that would be correct. Fourteen weeks isn't uh, enough time. There's, you know, he should have at least, um, he should have at least thirty weeks off, thirty two weeks off. He should have had six months off to reflect on life and reflect on everything else because I'm looking at okay he has a now he's going to take everything out on everybody who comes in front of him in court that's just my opinion he's human he's not god he's not you know perfect he's he's a, he's a, he's a gentleman who has flaws and I'm quite sure that that crack we're going to say allegedly high off crack the the legs right. the legs crack smoking judge you know he had a bone to pick with anybody that came that came to his court now from my understanding McBain had a mental meltdown because allegedly he called his wife in bed with a black man or messing around with a black man have you heard any of that Yes, I had heard that the rumor was going all around the county jail while I was in the trial. So, you know, people talk. So, you know, it's the old saying, like, when you were in the classroom and the teacher used to put you in a circle and, you know, they whisper in your ear and by the time it gets back to you, it's it's not what the teacher started off with. So we don't know if people added to it, switched it, chopped it up and screwed it. You know, that that is what I heard, you know, so I don't know if that's, what actually happened but I did notice that he did seem to give a lot of time to a lot of black males and just but just people in general I don't I don't know what that man's issue was but it didn't seem like he fulfilled his lawful duty to remain and be an impartial judge I say that okay now let me let me ask you this what was his just every day sitting in court with him what was it like? Mm -hmm. What was his mood swings like? What was he like? Um, to me, it felt like he had some type of personal vendetta, some type of personal problem with me because, you know, I, you always want to be honest with the judge, and you know, you, it, it's no problem for me to let a uh, judge know that yes, I've had some run-ins with the law. You know, I had been in trouble prior in Ohio, you know, I had minor criminal history. I had one felony that was um, an incident with my neighbor across the street, which was a fist fight that they bumped up to a felony somehow. I had four, I think four misdemeanors on my record besides that, but this man was looking at me like, you know, I was just the worst thing in the world. His eye contact with me, like his face would be bright red, like he was just, like he was irritated with me. Um, his tone of voice was just like rough, you know, hostile, like it was aggressive. And um, he was definitely for the prosecution. That was made known. You know, every time all of our motions that we had for the defense was denied while all the prosecution's motions was granted. And then every time when we would try to object to reasonable objections, he would overrule them. And then he would um, let the prosecution go forth with things that should have been you know, shot down. So it was just, he made it clear that he was for the prosecution. He was helping the prosecution. And that's not a judge's role. A judge's role is to be neutral. You know what I'm saying? Like, I watched the Michelle Blair case a little bit on TV, and this is a girl who put her children in the freezer for two years, and nobody knew where the kids were. But her judge was so soft-spoken to her, and she was, you know, acting a little... Um, I don't know what the word would be, a little aggressive herself in the courtroom. But still, you know, the judge had patience with her. The judge talked to her soft-spoken, and that's the judge's role. And he was lacking in that. And for him to tell me he hopes I die in the in the prison, like, why do you feel like that? You know, I don't know you. I watched the videos. And the videos right. that I saw of him, he was very disrespectful to you. And you may have some people say, mm -hmm. well... You know, he's a judge, she's a criminal, and we shouldn't respect criminals. That's bull crap. You are supposed... This woman was not found guilty. 
she was being tried. So right. you are innocent into proving guilty. And from what I've already right. what I saw on the videos, this judge had painted you guilty the moment that you walked in his court and sat down, you were guilty. Right. The way he spoke to you, I've never seen a judge speak to anyone like that at all. Unless the person was just real rowdy with them and disrespectful, and you didn't have that 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 meaner to yourself, demeanor about yourself, there I I saw you. You looked like you was a little agitated and upset, because in your eye, your face, you could tell that you knew that your fate was already sealed with this man. Did you feel that? Yes, that's exactly how I felt. I, I didn't feel like I had a chance, basically, because at the like at the last minute, this um, judge went and released all my witnesses from the subpoenas and sent them home. I pretty much knew right then I was going to get convicted. First of all, I don't understand how I even was getting um, charged with a first-degree murder because Michigan law says that first-degree means to premeditate. They don't have that, and they've even said that. You know, so I just, I basically felt like, yeah, I felt like they were against me in there, and that's not a good feeling. So maybe that's why, you know, the media was portraying me the way they was, or they were looking at me how they were, like, you know, she doesn't have remorse and this and that. But it's not an easy situation to be in that courtroom and to have people coming at you like that with all that hostility instead of giving you a fair chance, like how they're supposed to, you know, and look at you, look at the evidence. Look at the evidence for what it is. That's why I said in the courtroom, convict me. If you got me on a murder one, convict me with the truth. Don't convict me off a of lie. Because you tell me to come up here and raise my right hand and swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And then you sit up here and tell all these lies. Exactly. Now, let's talk about some of the court because he was put it on record. And that's, you know, that's a dangerous thing that if it's not true. He said that you were smirking and you were laughing and you were rolling your eyes through the whole trial. Explain that to us. Was that is that was that true at all? No, that wasn't true. I was sitting there, you know, I I feel like I was just trying to hold my composure because you have a prosecution who they can sit at you and use this aggressive tone and they can get all up in your personal space and point at you and, and call you a murderer and call you cold-blooded and call you a killer and, and they can twist facts because they don't know you as a person. They don't know, you know, here I am, I'm 30 years old, so you don't know the totality of me as a whole, but you have a couple documents sitting in front of you and you act like you know who I am for my whole entire life and you twist it and try to make me look like this bad person who I'm not. You know, but if you could, you want to get all these character people and talk about his character, why didn't you get no um, people to talk about my character, who I am as a person for my whole life? And then you lied about his character because you want to say he's not violent, he's not this, and he's not that, when in fact he is, but you hid the truth. So you're up in here and you're lying about me. So, yeah, that's a, that's a little frustrating because, you know, you're, you're painting this portrait of me of somebody that I'm not. You get what I'm saying? I understand that. You know, you want a conviction, but even in law, the prosecution is to uphold the law. It's not about getting a conviction. Their their duty is to uphold the law, and I've learned that since being here. So, you know, it's just, I wasn't smirking. There's nothing funny about this situation. I'm not proud of this. It's, it's nothing funny, you know, to be a person to have killed somebody or to have taken a life. There's, this is a very serious situation. There's nothing funny about that. But at sentencing, you know, when he's telling them he's going to duct tape my mouth and this and that, yeah, I did laugh. Everybody else see me laugh in the courtroom because basically that was me just being fed up of all of their lies. That was me just being sarcastic, like, okay, if you say you're going to duct tape my mouth, I'm basically telling him I want to see you duct tape my mouth because in my mind I know you don't have the authority to do that. Exactly. Now, there's no way in, the, in, 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 in God's green earth that they could not have said this man was violent, not violent, that he was a great person. This man has an aggravated assault. With a, with a weapon, other weapon. He has two criminal sexual conduct um, charges. He has a, well, no, actually three. He has a criminal sexual conduct penetration penis to vagina, and that was on Heather Malone. Then um, here we go. The next day, he has another criminal sexual conduct, second degree forcible contact. And then less than a month, a little bit over a month later, he has another sexual penetration penis vagina 
criminal sexual conduct third degree. So within in 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 one month, this man was out right. raping women, forcefully forcing himself yeah. on women. And you mean to tell me that this judge would not allow this in court? Exactly. Right. So and that's that's the whole thing. Like they they knew they knew that if the jury would see who he really was, that there was no way they could convict me. And that's why, okay, we gotta hide this. So they wanted to make me look like the violent one. They wanted to make me look like the bad person because they wanted a conviction. Exactly. Now you tell him here we go. The next the the okay, he raped Miss Heather Malone on February the tenth, two thousand and five. After he raped her the next day, he went out and raped another woman. Forcible contact. Then less than a month later, a little bit over a month later, a month and one week later, he went out sexually penetration, penis to vagina, criminal sexual conduct third degree on another woman. Yeah, it was like he was a serial rapist. Yeah, that's what it that's what it um boils down to and they they hit all that they they didn't want them to know you know but when it comes down to it the truth is the truth so i was okay with them bringing in my criminal history basically the ruling at first from the judge is that we're going to bring in her criminal history and we're going to bring in his too but as the trial went along you have to one with minute and remaining she didn't want that to happen because she knew what was going to happen if the jury seen that so at the last minute and this literally was like after the after the prosecution rested, she starts arguing, and she comes in with some bogus argument about, well, it came to me over the weekend, and this was after the prosecution had rested. She was like, I was thinking over the weekend, I did some research, and this testimony is irrelevant and inadmissible, and before I know it, he was like, well, the uh, defense has a 10-minute recess, and he was like, okay, I'm releasing all the defense witnesses from the subpoena, send them home, and then he looked at me, and he looked at my lawyer, and he was like, uh, do you have anybody you want to call uh, for the defense? And when that happened, I was like, I'm, I'm here. Like, I knew what it was. You knew, yeah, because you, you were set up. He, the fight was fixed. The fight was fixed. Yeah. 